Today is February 27th, 2023. We are in weeds. We are in the last session for the month of February. And tonight's topic is righteousness, the gift, the guarantee. Um, we're also going to spend a bit of time recapping this, this month of February, the things that we covered, the things that um, we experienced. So please feel free um, as you're led, let's, let's talk, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is do a brief recap of this month. We began this month, and as I said before we started recording, that I was really looking forward to this evening because I've been thinking about everything we've covered this month, how, at least for me, God has been so present um, in terms of the study and the things we're studying, but also the experiences that are taking place as a result. The, the first week in February, we talked about what I've been calling a three-part exploration. It was kind of a setup. So we talked about application being the proof of apprehension. If you're able to apply it, it means you've got it. And I don't mean apprehension in the sense of being nervous or apprehensive. I mean apprehending as in grabbing, taking hold of. Like when a criminal is apprehended, the law has taken hold of them and now has them in custody. The things that you learn in your life, the, the things that you are able to apprehend take hold of in your life, to take in custody in your life. The proof that you're able to do that is your ability to apply them. And I think it's Acme Technical School. Please correct me, those of you who are familiar. There was a commercial that used to come on where a guy was walking around talking about this technical school, and he would say that as you learn the tool, it would go in your toolbox. You guys remember that? As you, as you learn the tool, you got to keep it. It went in your toolbox. Well, this is the same thing. As you walk with the Lord, as you walk with Christ, the things you learn, the proof that you have learned them, the proof that you have apprehended, taken hold, taken into custody, the proof that you're able to do that is how they're applied in your life. That's one proof. And when we get to peace, we're going to talk about another proof. But that was one thing we talked about that, that, that first Monday of this month. And then we talked about doulos, your identity in Christ. You are an owned thing. You are one that God has taken possession of. You have been purchased. As the old hymn says, I'm an heir of salvation purchased of God. And something occurred to me this, this past week um, is that even though I grew up in a system that taught a Wesleyan Arminian theology, we sang Blessed Assurance. And I thought that was very interesting because clearly there's a contradiction between the understanding of that system and then what this hymn is saying, right? This, this hymn, when you think about it, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, and you go through the hymn, what an amazing testimony of the assurance of salvation that you can never lose. Why? because you're an heir, and an heir means that you're a family member, a beneficiary, and that you have been purchased. And then it goes on to say that you are born of his spirit, meaning that there is new life that is in you, and you are washed in his blood. You have been made clean. Your identity in Christ is an owned thing, a purchased one, one who was loved so much that there was, and I'm not using John 3.16 to say that God loved the world so much. I'm not saying that. I am saying that God loved you and purchased you uniquely, individually. The third thing we talked about that, that first week was that God's love language is obedience. There's all this discussion about love languages and and how do you communicate? Well, God, God's love language is obedience. 
Jesus said it more than once. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll do as I say. And then the second week we talked about joy. We spent a good amount of time on joy. And we talked about the fact that joy transcends happiness. And I was so glad during that particular session when Jason raised the questions that he raised because, you know, there was just a piece that wasn't fully coming together for me in all the years that I have been walking through this, this concept of righteousness and peace and joy and how they all fit together. And so I was very grateful for that. And that was like a big bonus for me that week. So I, I love when that kind of thing happens. And then last week we talked about peace and how peace is freely given, but you must fight to maintain it. I was appreciative that the Lord showed us how Paul in his writing addresses both the individual and the community, dealing first with the individual and peace with God, and then deals with how that's expressed in community. And just by a show of hands, how many of us were severely attacked in terms of peace right after that message? Because that happened over here. And I know talking to some of you that it also happened in your homes. Was that a gen was that a, a general thing? Did you find that after Monday night, if you know, was was your peace challenged in significant ways last week? And I'm asking that because one of the things that one of my former mentors used to say is that every decision for righteousness will be challenged, right? Anything. Jesus talks about the, the seed being sown and immediately birds coming to get it, right? So it, it was interesting to have this, this wonderful session on peace and coming to a greater understanding of what that was. And literally the next morning, or the next afternoon getting that challenged. So it was an opportunity to do what we had learned the week before, which was to count it all joy when you are tested. Because you know that there is fruit of the testing, right? So all that has been just really wonderful for me to go through this, this past few weeks um, I want to just leave the floor open for another three to five minutes. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about in terms of what you experienced this past month um, with the other things we handled? Did anything stand out to you? Did it, you know, benefit you or was it actually a problem? Um, this, I'll give a few minutes for that before we jump into um, this last piece, which is righteousness. Okay. Wait, um, before, I, was, I was just, I was just kind of leaving it open, but before you go uh, or move on, in in terms of the peace and joy, uh, definitely, uh, as you taught, we do have to fight to maintain it and to to exercise um, exercise our willpower to walk in it. And I will say, you know, uh, just in the past week, uh, just meditating on the peace, uh, one of the things that the Holy Spirit showed to me is that well, obedience is the path to peace, right? Um, That's good. Yeah, we, we, we're not going to find that peace of God with us unless we obey him. So I just... Uh, I just wanted to share that and then also comment on, uh, yeah, as a, as a teacher of the word of God, everything you, you, uh, you teach, uh, you definitely get uh, practice <laughs> of exercising. So that's all. Amen. Amen.
That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This reminded me of the old hymn, right? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obedience is the path to peace. Amen. All right. So righteousness. What is righteousness? And on the first slide, there was a there was a dictionary definition. Righteousness is the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Righteousness is the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Now, it's important, and I want you to grab hold of this, that Excuse me, being morally right is a condition. Justifiable applies to one's actions. You see it? The quality of being morally right. To be morally right is a condition. You're morally right. That is a that's a condition that you may find yourself in on occasion. To be justifiable is more concerned with one's actions. Like we hear the the term um, very often, justifiable homicide. Can this action that the person took be understood as justifiable? Was there a reason, right? So righteousness is the quality of being morally right in terms of one's status, one standing, a condition, and then justifiable applies to one's actions. So what is righteousness in the Bible? Let's look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, righteousness is one of the chief attributes of God. Specifically, the righteousness of God is the divine attribute that describes God as acting always in a way that is consistent with his own character. God always acts in ways that are consistent with his own character. Remember how we've talked about the fact that fairness is not a biblical quality? God does not deal with fairness. God deals with what is just and what is right. Yes. Because fairness is almost situational and fairness is based on the perception of the person who is acting whereas righteousness and justice are fixed things okay and we're going to see that as we look at god's attributes psalm 89 for example psalm 89 Looking at verses 13 to 15, Psalm 89, verses 13 to 15. You have a mighty arm. Your hand is powerful. Your right hand is lifted high. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Faithful love and truth go before you. Happy are the people who know the joyful shout, Yahweh, they walk in the light of your presence. Note here that the psalmist declares in verse 14, and you see the same thing in Psalm 97, verse 2, that righteousness and justice, the Hebrew words are sedek and mishpat, they are the foundation of God's throne. Uh -huh. okay. Not only is this a foundation or a footing or a support, but Yahweh is also called one of the names of God. We call him Jehovah Sidkenu, which is the Lord, our righteousness. And we're going to look at that in one minute, but I want to take, take your eyes back to verse 13. You have a mighty arm. Your hand is powerful. Your right hand is lifted high. Think about that imagery 
and think about it from what you know now, okay? Think about Romans 5, 1, talking about Jesus making peace between us and God. Think about the fact that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Think about the fact that a the reason, as we've discussed many, many times, most of the time, the swordsmen held their sword in their right hand and their shield in their left. Scripture is saying that his right hand is powerful and his right hand is lifted high. That is about your savior. And we're going to see that when we get into Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verses five and six. Jeremiah 23, verses five and six. The days are coming, this is the Lord's declaration, when I will raise up a righteous branch of David. A branch is an offshoot, right? A branch yeah. comes from the, the trunk of a tree. He is raising up a righteous branch of David. He, the branch, will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. This is what he will be named, Yahweh, our righteousness. Yahweh Sidkenu. God himself. Go ahead, Jason. Um, just going back to Psalm 89 that you mentioned, and uh, the, you also cross-reference -ref um, in the Old Testament about um, uh, shield in the left hand and sword in the right, and mm -hmm. also when they were building the wall, uh, trowel in one hand and mm -hmm. spear in another or sword in another. Mm -hmm. um, could so not only is the imagery exalting Christ's ascension and current position, but is it also a position uh, that is ready to strike? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Because because if you look at what he says in 23, in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, right? The branch is going to be raised up and he's going to reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. The way they right. administer justice is by exercising power. Yes, yes. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So very definitely. The, the fact that he is called the conquering lion of Judah, and it says here that Judah will be saved. One of the things that we understood when we studied Revelation is that Judah is the first tribe that is listed in the list of the 12 tribes in Revelation, contrary to Every place else where you see the 12 sons and the 12 tribes noted, Reuben is mentioned first. Judah is mentioned first because it is out of that tribe that the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Conqueror will come. So in his days, Judah will be saved. Being that we are, he is the firstborn among many brethren, can you guess spiritually what tribe you're in? You are the tribe of Judah. Right, Judah. Okay? And so in his days, and we know that we are in his days because he is already ascended and is seated on his throne. In his yeah. days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. Am I talking about the nation state of Israel? No. Yeah. I'm talking about the people that he will gather unto himself. And this is what he will be named, Yahweh Sidkenu, Yahweh our righteousness. God himself is right and just and true. Righteousness is his very being and it categorizes all that he does. God is morally and ethically right. 
and he acts only in, keep, in keeping with what is right and just. Again, not fair, but right and just. God is not concerned with equality and equity. God is concerned with righteousness and justice. God is not concerned with the things that we get so tied up in. God has his own agenda and his own way of viewing that which he has created. And if we are wise, we learn to, as our former pastor used to say, see life from God's point of view. Yes. Now let's look at how righteousness is handled for the person in the Old Testament, and then we're gonna look at the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you see righteousness as a code of conduct. Leviticus 19, 35 to 37. We see righteousness as a code of conduct. Leviticus 19, 35 to 37. It says, you must not be unfair in measurements of length, weight, or volume. You ought to have honest balances, honest weights, an honest dry measure, an honest liquid measure. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You must keep my, all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am Yahweh. So acting righteously, <clears throat> excuse me, honesty, is an attribute of righteousness. Honest balances, how you deal not only in business, but in life. How do you deal with people? Are you honest with them? Okay, this is this is what, what he's talking about. An honest weight, honest dry measure. You know, we, we have seen rather jokingly how, you know, the butcher will put certain cuts of meat on the top and certain cuts on the bottom to make it look a different way in the showcase. And then you don't know what you're buying, right? Those kinds of things. God is saying, don't be like that. That's not how you act. Righteousness is a code of conduct, but it is also a status that is conferred. Psalm 1-6 says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Yes. So how is that a, a conferred status? And I just see what, something that I left off. <laughs> how is that a conferred status? How do we know that that is not about a code of conduct? We know because the Psalms say that there is no one who is righteous. Yes. Not one. Not one. And so if there is no one who is righteous, which is about their nature, then Psalm 1-6 must be talking about a conferred status. Does that make sense? And I'm typing in the chat so I can keep track of the notes for the it, things that are jumping out to me. When you say conferred status, are you, are you speaking specifically to how it is given or I'm how talking it, about, or how I'm talking it. about what God says. It says the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. And I, I need, in the Psalm. So how can that be if there's no one who is righteous? Well, I need more context. I need you to well, give well, me here the context of here conferred. It Confer here it is. To, to, to confer something is to give something, right. to assign something, right? So, so he is conferring or assigning a status of righteousness because there is no one who is in and of themselves righteous. Oh, okay. As, as Isaiah points out, all of our righteousness, and he's exactly. talking about our acts. Exactly. So for there to be people who he is calling righteous, he has to be conferring a status on them because they are not able of themselves to be that thing. Mm -hmm. So if he's conferring righteousness to them, they're still attributing it to their works. No, no. 
Hi, we're in the why would it, why would it why would it have anything to do with their works? Because if all of our righteousness, all of the things that we manifest, that we do, all of the signs of our righteousness to him are as filthy rags. Keep in mind, let's look at as a matter of fact, let's look at Zechariah three. This is a, a great and this is a great question, and Zechariah three is a, a great example. I'm going to it and I'm going to put it up on the screen in a minute. So for those of you who cannot see the screen, we're looking at Zechariah 3, starting at verse 1. So Zechariah 3, <clears throat> starting at verse 1, says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now, some context here. Joshua is the high priest symbolizing the best that the people have to offer, okay? Number one. Number two, notice that it says here, the Lord says, the Lord rebuke you. That speaks to a plurality in the Godhead. Which Lord is speaking and which Lord is going to rebuke, okay? The next thing I want you to look at is what does it say about Joshua? Verse 3, now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. This is the best that the people of God have. And in God's presence, his righteousness is filthy rags as Isaiah says. So the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him and said, <clears throat> take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, see, I have removed your guilt from you. Doesn't that sound a lot like Isaiah 6? Isaiah is standing before the Lord and he sees himself as an unclean thing in the midst of an unclean people and speaking with an unclean mouth. And so to make him right, the angel brings a burning coal and touches his lips to clean him. Here you see, verse six, verse, <clears throat> sorry, before we get there, I have removed your guilt from you. I've removed your sin from you. Everything that you think is good, to me, is filth. And so he is clothed in splendid robes. And then Zechariah says, and let them put a clean turban on his head, which is symbolic of a new positioning as well. And you can see that later by what happens to him. In the same way that Isaiah is is then sent when the Lord says, who will go for us and who will I send? That amazing plural, who will go for us? Who's us, right? And Isaiah says, send me, I'll go. And Isaiah is, is reassigned, right? So here is Joshua. Joshua is given a set of instructions. This is what the Lord of hosts says, verse 7. If you walk in my ways, keep my instructions, you will both rule my house and take care of my courts. I will also grant you access among those who are standing here. If you obey, if you obey, this new change of relationship that you have will continue. But the righteousness that was conferred to him was not based on his works because there was nothing clean about him. There was nothing good about his works that would make God regard them 
in any significant way. And that is why Isaiah says, all of our righteousness is as it's filthy rags. We are an unclean thing, all right? Should we dig more or does that answer the question, bro? I'll wait till you get to the New Testament because I do have some new, some questions. Okay, it's the same context there. So we'll do that. So righteousness in the New Testament, similarly, is discussed as behavioral. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Matthew 5, 17 to 20, Jesus says, don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's great. But look at this. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What he's just said there is that it's impossible. The scribes and the Pharisees allegedly were completely devoted to the law of Moses and fulfilling it in every way possible so to be considered righteous. And Jesus is saying, you got to do even better than that. And the people understood, well, there's no way. Right. Right. So there's got to be another way. Look at what Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17, righteousness is a conferred status. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Three chapters later in chapter four, verses four to eight, he says, now to the one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the man God credits righteousness to apart from works. How joyful are those lawless acts, or how joyful are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How joyful is the man the Lord will never charge with sin. What is Paul saying? But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteous. His faith is credited for righteousness. And of course, he's referring to Abraham, right? Not as one who's ungodly, but Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And again, David also speaks of the blessing of the man who God credits righteousness to apart from works. In Romans chapter 10, Paul actually contrasts these two things, behavioral and conferred righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 13. Romans 10, 1 to 13. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. And he's talking about the Jews. I can testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, because they disregard the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness. They've not submitted themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
For Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. Verse 6, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Verse 8, on the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you, and everybody knows this, if you, verse nine, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Does that mean that belief is a work? No. Verse 11, now the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, what does that look like? Is it an outward expression? Is it an inward reality? Yes, it's not either or, it's both. And James makes that very clear when he says in chapter two, James chapter two, starting at verse 14, James chapter two, starting at verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. What is he saying? Application is the proof of apprehension. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith from my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. Verse 20, foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the message the messengers and sent them out by a different route. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So James makes the case that actions, works of righteousness, are the result or outgrowth of belief or faith. Righteous acts, according to James, include works of charity. And that agrees with Matthew 6, chapter, Matthew 6, 1 to 4, and 2 Corinthians 9, 9, which reference the Jewish practice of doing tzedakah, which is charity, as well as avoiding sins of the law. So here's the, here's the thing. Here's where we tie it together. So it is that you act because you are as opposed to you are because you act. With God, you act because you are. Just like he says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. He doesn't say you're not my sheep because you don't believe. Same principle here, you act because of who you are, as opposed to you are because you act. Now, 
Remember when we were talking about going back a couple weeks, we were talking about the fact that our actions that we undertake once we are saved are out of our love for God. They're out of our seeking to obey God. Those are things that we do because, as the old, old song says, we love him because he first loved us. We live responsively to him. He places in us his spirit, we respond, right? The things that we do, the way that we walk in the world are directly a response to how he is at work in us, right? For we are his workmanship created unto <clears throat> good works that we may walk in them. We live, and I'm going to present a new phrase to many of you this evening, we live coram Deo. Coram Deo means before the sight of God. We live before the sight of God. We live coram Deo. It means to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. Okay? We all know that we live in the presence of God because God is omnipresent. But what many of us don't deal with is living under the authority of God and living to the glory of God. We're passively aware of his omnipresence. We are, I will say, situationally aware of his authority. But are we aware that our mindset and our behaviors and our actions should be being aware of his presence, submitting to his authority, and being purposeful about living to his glory? What makes a person righteous in God's eyes? A person is righteous in the sight of God, he's in a right relationship with God when he simply receives the imputed obedience of Christ and the forgiveness of sins through faith. Remember that the reason that you are in the position you're in is because Jesus's obedience, his righteousness are imputed to you because there's no way you could have done any of this for yourself. You could not perfectly maintain the law. You could not provide a suitable sacrifice for sin. You could not be a suitable sacrifice for sin. He took all of that on. And his works are imputed to us and we are called righteous, not our works making us righteous, his. This righteousness is passive in terms of anything that we're doing and comes apart from the law because we cannot uphold the law. Note also to be aware of the presence of God is also to be acutely aware of his sovereignty. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is our master. He is our God. We are his emissaries, we are his children, we are his doulos, we are those that he has chosen to confer a title upon. And so our actions should be in keeping with what we know to be true about ourselves. In 1 Peter 1, Peter calls all people of faith to live a life of holiness, literally, Holy living means that the Christian lives a life that is set apart, reserved to give glory to God. It is a life of discipline, focus, and attention to matters of righteous living. It is a Koran Deo life. I know I've said a lot here. Are there any questions before we move on?
Okay. To be in God's presence, He is your King. What are those other names again? He is our King. He is our God. He is our Father. All of those things. We are aware of His sovereignty. He is the King. He is sovereign. We are His servants. We are His slaves. We are His children. And we're going to talk about being his children in a couple of minutes. Okay. First Peter 1, 13 to 25. First Peter 1, 13 to 25. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't set your hope on your works. Don't set your hope on your ability. What does he say? Set your hopes completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And if you address as father, the one who judges impartially based on each one's work, you are to conduct yourself in fear during the time of your temporary residence. If you address God as father, notice what he says God does. He judges impartially. Okay. Fairness takes into consideration extenuating circumstances. God's not concerned with that. God does not judge fairly. He judges impartially. He judges in righteousness based on each person's work. And if you call this this being father, you are to conduct yourself in fear during the time of your temporary residence. Temporary residence, of course, meaning this life. Fear meaning awareness, acute awareness, regard, okay? This doesn't mean that you walk around looking up in the sky trembling. That's not what this means. This means that you are to conduct yourself in awareness of God, okay? It is the reason why Jewish men wear yarmulkes, right? The yarmulke is symbolic of being in God's presence and being unworthy, so you keep your head covered. That's the point. Some people wear them all the time. Some people wear them only when they're in the temple or what have you. But the point is, you're symbolizing that you are aware of God's presence. If I were a Jew, I would be using two-sided tape to hold mine on, as opposed to the little hair clips that, you know, you see people wear. but as a side note. Verse 18, yes, Jason. Can you expand a little bit on uh, verse 14, the former ignorance? Yes, before you came into the knowledge of the truth, you were ignorant. Before you came to know Christ as Savior, you were ignorant. And now that you have, number one, been aware of who he is, and number two, you have been adopted into the family, so you are a child. Now that you're a kid, now that you're a child in this family, okay, so says Mr. Impetuous himself, right? If there's if there's anybody that that you could look at in the Bible as being a complete knucklehead and yet loved of God. It, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but Peter really is up there. And look at what he's saying. As obedient children, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. The way you used to live, the way you used to walk in the world, you know, everything was was fleshly. You were guided by your lusts. You know, you you were tossed to and fro by any and everything. You are aware as a child that there is a different way that this family walks in the world. Right? You know, when growing up, especially if you grew up in a Caribbean household, you knew when you walked out, 
that you were representing yourself and everybody else that had your name. So there was a way that you walked in the world, right? You didn't do any old thing. That's what Peter is saying here. Do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Verse 18, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Verse 20, he was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of times for you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Verse 22, by obedience to the truth, having purified yourself for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you as the gospel. You see what he's saying? You, you don't live like you used to because you're not who you used to be. You don't walk like you used to because you're not in that family. You used to be. Verse 18, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers. What did you get from your, from your earthly father? An empty way of life. Conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, as he says in verse 14. You're in a new family. You have a new life. You're born again. And you are not born of perishable seed. What is he making reference to? The fact that a man's seed is, is perishable like the man is, right? Remember, Onan was destroyed by God because he spilled his seed on the ground. His seed perished. You're not born of perishable seed. You are born of imperishable seed. Who's done this work? He's done this work. He promised in Malachi. It's funny how we spend so much time reading Malachi 3 in church when they want you to give and they tell you you should tithe everything. Right but look at what the beginning of chapter 3 says. There is such a great promise at the beginning of chapter 3 of Malachi. The Lord says, see, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Every time I read that verse, Handel's Messiah is in my head, right? But who can endure the day of his coming and who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like cleansing lye, or as, as, as King James says, like a fuller's soap. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then, they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. What is that saying? They were presenting offerings to the Lord before, but they weren't in righteousness because it was based on what they were able to do. But one is coming who is going to purify. He will be like fire and lie. He is going to burn away all of the dross, all of the impurities, all the sin. He's going to cleanse. And once he does that, once the sons of Levi, those who make the offerings in the temple, 
those who live their lives to serve the Lord. Yes, I'm talking about you. Once you are refined like gold and silver, then you will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in the days of old and years gone by. That was Malachi 3, 1 to 4. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, starting at verse 11. Isaiah 54, starting at verse 11. Poor Jerusalem, storm-tossed and not comforted, I will set your stones in black mortar and lay your foundations in sapphire. I will make your fortifications out of rubies, your gates out of sparkling stones, and your walls out of precious stones. Verse 13, then all your children will be taught by the Lord, their prosperity will be great, and you will be established on a foundation of righteousness. What did we read that God's throne was a foundation of? Okay. Go ahead, Vernon. Righteousness and justice. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to it. I'm going back to it. The yeah, righteous, yep, righteousness and justice. Yep. The foundation. Sadek, Sadek and Mishpat. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, what is he promising? His children, Jerusalem, poor battered Jerusalem. He says that your children will be taught by the Lord. Their prosperity will be great and you will be established on a foundation of righteousness. You will be far from oppression. You will certainly not be afraid. You will be far from terror. It will certainly not come near you. Verse 15, if anyone attacks you, it is not from me. Whoever attacks you will fall before you. Verse 16, look, I have created the craftsman who blows on the charcoal fire and produces a weapon suitable for its task, and I have created the destroyer to cause havoc. Verse 17, this verse we all know, no weapon formed against you shall succeed and you will refute every accusation raised against you in court. Or as King James says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise up against you in judgment you shall condemn. And then look what it says. This is the heritage of the Lord's servants and their righteousness is from God me. It is your heritage. It's your heritage, child of God. That because God's righteousness is imputed to you, you will be able to stand and nothing, no accusation that is brought against you will succeed. We see that, we just read it in Zechariah 3, that, that the devil is standing there, right there, trying to accuse him. And the Lord rebukes him. Not because of anything that, that, that the high priest was able to do, because he was filthy. But the Lord imputed his own righteousness to him and clothed him in splendid garments. You see it? That's the promise for you. So while everybody is getting up and running and shouting because no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper, understand the reason why. It is because he has imputed his righteousness to you. The concept of imputed righteousness carries over into, look at the time. Okay, okay, okay. The concept of imputed righteousness carries over and Paul discusses it in Romans chapter eight. All right, please give me till 9.05, seven minutes and we should be able to finish, okay? 
I'm sorry. Romans 8, Romans 8, starting at verse 1. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Because the law spirit, because the spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in flesh like ours under sin's domain and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirements would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse five, for those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, think about the things of the spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Verse eight, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Verse 12, so then brothers, we're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those led by God's spirit are God's son. Verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. Hallelujah. What does it mean to be adopted? It means to be brought into a new family. To be adopted means to be given the father's name. To be adopted means that you're identified by your new name and the attributes of your father. And what a huge family it is. Revelation 7, 9 says, after this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. We have been grafted into, adopted into a huge family. So while we are walking in this earth, while we are walking in this flesh, it is our job to live Coram Deo. It is our job to be aware of him in the way that we act, the way that we live, the way that we walk, the way that we speak in the world. Because his righteousness has been imputed to us. It is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Amen? Amen.